Um, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for um, showing up to the 337th meeting of uh, the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. Uh, this is the second um, event of our fall uh, 2022 calendar. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people that were here last week for uh, Aiden Koch's talk that that kicked off the calendar. And um, we are here today for uh, Jason T. Miles, um, our, our second entry this season. And um, just a, a few quick words about the symposium up front, less than I talked about um, last week because we're in the season now. Um, my name's Austin English. I'm a cartoonist, educator. Uh, I also write about comics. I am substituting this semester for uh, Ben Catcher, who has run the symposium for uh, a little bit over a decade and, and was the host of the, the first 335 meetings. Um, so I'm just filling in for, for Ben, who's on sabbatical uh, for this semester. Um, the, the symposium was founded about a decade ago. Um, again, as I said last week, kind of out of um, um, principles and ideals extending in the wake of Occupy Wall Street with a focus on um, bringing in people to talk about artists and people interested in comics to talk about comics in a free form kind of way um, uh, in, in, with, with, with subjects that they could choose, issues that they could talk about with an emphasis on um, <clears throat> participation of an audience that was able to access this material crucially for free. Um, so all of you here in the audience, um, after as you listen to Jason, I hope that you'll, um, uh, as you have questions, um, when this was when when the symposium was in person, and we'll be doing a few uh, in person events this season, uh, which I'll have more info on later. Um, but when this event was in person, it was really encouraged for people to chime in with questions when they felt it was necessary, and especially after the talk was over uh, to ask questions. So you might see a chat um, box uh, underneath, um, underneath where you see the speaker. So as Jason is talking, I really encourage you guys to, um, to write out what you're interested in, in asking him. And, and as the talk goes on, that way, when it's over, we can refer back to your questions and I can allow you to, to say them out loud or I can read them for you, um, wh whichever you're more comfortable with. I'm just gonna put a couple of links in the chat here. Uh, the first um, is, uh, give me one second. Uh, the first is just a link to our um, our fall 2022 20, calendar. So if there's um, things on there, I, I would if you're, if you're interested in this series, I really encourage you um, to look into some of these and see what's coming up that you might also be interested in. And I'm also gonna put in a link now for our YouTube channel. Oh, um, okay, here. This has archives of past events, um, including our event last week. And um, there's, uh, I think over a hundred different archived um, talks on this, YouTube, um, on this YouTube channel. As we all know, there's tons and tons of talk about comics and channels about comics on YouTube, but for our kinds of comics, <laughs> uh, comics from, um, from the persuasion that I think most of us are, are very interested in, I don't think there's a ton of um, stuff on YouTube. So I'm very grateful to, to build um, this archive for, for people interested in this kind of material. Um, and and uh, we encourage anyone um, doing research into, into different artists that have spoken at the symposium to use this channel. So I'm gonna uh, stop taking up so much time here. I'm going to just uh, introduce Jason. Now, I wanna start off by saying some of my own personal feelings about Jason's work and, and why I felt it was important to bring him in to talk um, um, for this calendar uh, season. Uh, Jason's, I've followed Jason's work for um, about 15 years now. And Jason's art and his thinking about comics, um, he's, he's someone who I, Feel, and I don't want to, um, you know, speak, Jason's going to speak in a second. So all the mistakes I'm making can, in, in explaining who he is can be corrected soon. Um, but Jason is someone with a, a deep interest in comics past and comics present. Uh, but that interest is crucially not superficial and it's not about pastiche interest in, in, um, in uh, that, that ends, begins and ends with, with questions of style or, or questions of who worked on what, although it does encompass those things as well. I think Jason has a deep interest in confronting um, comics and art in general head on and seeing what is actually um, happening in a piece when you read it and how it affects you, 
rather than um, rather than making generalizations about what the art is based on received ideas. And I think that thinking about art and that that thinking about comics in specific um, in particular extends to Jason's artwork itself. And when I whenever I encounter a Jason T. Miles comic or a story, there's a real um, uh, intense intention behind every line of his work. And I can say for cartoonists of my generation and people who um, think about comics from my generation, um, Jason's work, particularly a work um, called Dead Ringer that he put out with Lomano Press uh, have been very formative and have been very important pieces of artwork to think about and to, to, to receive a feeling from. Um, and I, I, can't, I can't say en enough about Jason's work. So now I'm going to just read a quick um, biography of Jason that's been provided for us here uh, by, by Jason, just to give you some um, nuts and bolts about him. Jason <clears throat> T. Mile is a cartoonist, writer, artist, editor, and publisher. His most recent work includes Kill Comics, Spewy, Crime Destroyer, True Till Death, Fake Comics, and Monster Fan Club. So without further ado, I am going to um, welcome Jason T. Miles to the New York Comics and Picture Symposium and take it away, Jason. All right, thanks, Austin. Thanks for the, the introduction. Um, yeah, so to start, um, I just wanted to read aloud the description of what I hope to get into. Um, so this is what I sent to Austin as, as uh, you know, stuff that I was interested in. Um, swiping, stealing, copying, appropriation or plagiarism, generational shame into impurity of motive, into fellowship, recombination, into ego deflation, into transformation. And then, you know, provided we have time, maybe we'll this might overlap with something else I'm really interested in, which is the idea of the cartoonist and, uh, and trying to nullify uh, sort of fanciful associations that, that we might have with what that is. So to start, I'd like to take just like a moment, if you guys are up for it, to, to just, um, if you have a piece of paper nearby or if you just wanna hold it, hold it in your, your brain, um, like everyone to just try and think about, you know, what, what would, how would they define swiping? Um, does it matter uh, if it's comics related or not, but uh, try to hold, uh, hold into, you know, hold into your mind or get it down, like what you think swiping is, um, just go, you know. And uh, as maybe you're wrapping that up or you're already done, let's, I'd also like to do the same with, with uh, like you to picture or, or write down or consider, you know, when I say the words, the, you know, the idea of the cartoonist, what is that for you? I'm really curious. I'm, I'm super curious what the idea of a cartoonist is for you personally also what you think swiping is. And, and I'm hoping we can revisit this, um, you know, later in the talk. Um, Okay, so um, as you're maybe wrapping that up or already done, I thought um, it might be fun to start with uh, with some, I just found, just came across these. I'm sorry they're not scanned. I'm gonna have to hold them up in front of the camera, but these are the earliest swipes of mine that I could, that I could find. And uh, 
a big thank you to my my mom, rest in peace, but she yeah, she saved all this stuff. So this was uh, this was my first swipe. And if I remember correctly, this is from How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. And I guess I'd like to point out that I clearly traced this um, and then did some some variation on the costume. Someone's at the door. I got it. Um, here's another one. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's also tracing. And I didn't like, you know, how the costume came came about. So I just did the whole thing in black and, you know, just so not to cause any confusion, I named this character the Black Knight. Uh, clearly not Spider-Man. Um, I remember as a kid wanting to be a professional cartoonist was an early desire of mine. And uh, coming from a family of artists, you know, I thought they would have the inside scoop on how to do that. And my mom uh, suggested that I copy uh, cartoonists pre-existing work and you know try to experience what it would be like to, to maybe actually do the finished drawing and i don't know maybe this this talk is evidence that i took that a little too seriously or too close to heart because it's something I'm, I'm still doing to this day but yeah so here's rob liefeld swipe eric larson swipe that's when spider-man became a cyborg for only an issue i wish he'd Maybe done that more and more. Another Liefeld, Rob Rob Liefeld, one of the co-founders of Image Comics. He's clearly, clearly into his stuff, and uh, finished it with this Todd McFarlane Spawn copy. Note the giant guns, chains, and a that's a cape. So. You know, starting from a young age, I was interested in, in uh, you know, trying to, to both, you know, be my own artist, but also fit in with, with what was being done, with what was already being made. Uh, and I was also, I think it's worth noting, um, viewing this as not only a passion, but a prospective career. Like this was something that I thought, wow, I could draw all day and get paid for it clearly. Like, look at these guys. So, um, you know, as is probably evident based on the popularity of my name, that didn't quite happen. Uh, and a lot of things happened in between then and now. So I thought I would, um, let's see here, as a, as a get to know you or me rather, real quick, I'm gonna share my screen I think I am. Maybe I'm not. Oh, there it is. Sorry. <clears throat> I've got some PDFs here. Okay. So just real quick, um, these are some uh, comics and zines that I've made. Uh, most of them I self-published and assembled myself. Um, this one's called Untitled, uh, and I'm just just gonna go through real quick here. This on the left, or I don't know how it's appearing to you guys, probably the same. Is a comic called Crime Destroyer, where I was a co-writer on uh, this collaboration. I was a, a really fun job, and um, 86 is a comic that I made about masculinity and trying to get into my own. Uh, and the impact of of superhero comics masculinity on myself then and now and if you oh sideways um one's uh yeah so just i'm gonna you're just gonna have to tilt your head apparently um this is a project called love wins that's uh i believe 16 issues of that um kill comics was a series that i did oh man this is a bummer um Sorry. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, that's no good. They all turned on me. How did that happen? 
<laughs> um, okay, well, um, so I've also been working in comics for, you know, 20 years. I've been making comics. I've also been working uh, uh, in publishing, uh, editing comics, doing all sorts of other things behind the scenes. Here's some of the books that I edited. This is uh, In Christ There Is No East or West by Mike Taylor. Uh, Humbug, which is a collection of comics by Harvey Kurtzman, Will Elder and Friends. Book on Flannery O'Connor's cartoons. Gilbert Hernandez is The Children of Palomar. Also his book, Julio's Day. One of my favorites was Bread and Wine by the uh, science fiction author Samuel Delaney and the illustrator Mia Wolf and uh, Zegas by Michelle Fife. So that's, I don't know, some of my, my bona fides. Um, so I was hoping to, let's see if this opens in the front, nope. Okay. There hey, we Jason. Go. hey, Jason, if you can hear me, you can just show the images like sometimes uh, in PDF mode, it does that, like it flips them. Um, if you just want to go into the files and pop them up one by one and talk to talk about them like that, it's a little, it's slightly more awkward, but not that big of a deal. We can still, that way we can see the images and hear your reaction to them, but it's totally okay. up to you. Okay, yeah, I will, I will try that. So, okay, we're getting back to this. Um, Crime Destroyer, there was 86. Uh, this was just like a weird little art zine uh, I made of uh, sketches. This was like a one man anthology, Kill Comics. This was when I started to uh, try to uh, let go more and, and, and sort of nullify my idea of the cartoonist. Um, uh, Love Wins uh, was a, I guess I would put it, uh, a kind of a non-consensual <laughs> collaboration. Uh, I didn't charge anything for it. It was really just, uh, as I saw it, kind of like a telephone pole where people could put stuff up on it. Probably one of my favorite things I had a, a hand in uh, you know, being part of. Uh, it, it did a lot of things that um, you know I didn't expect. I, I, I loved not being in control of it. So here's the second issue of Kill Comics. Um, and so right here, this issue of Pines, you can see in here, um, my cursor, I'm, this, this is a cover was made of, of swipe, like a series of swipes being recombined. Uh, here's a book called What It's Like, a collection of my comics put out by Cold Cube uh, called Spewy. Uh, another issue of Kill Comics, Collaboration with Tim Goodyear, John Doe. Collection of experimental comics, jazz comics, anthology I put together of underground horror comics called Insect Bath. Book of one page comics featuring a lightning bolt as a character called Lightning Snake. Uh, here was a book that I put together, um, Apocalypse 5000. And uh, we'll get into Ken Landgraf in a sec. Uh, also had the honor to co-publish Tad Martin uh, with uh, Teenage Dinosaur. And here's some drawings. Now this started when I was really, uh, started really embracing um, swiping and recombination in earnest. And this is from, gosh, about maybe like 10 years ago. And so all these figures you see here are, uh, this, these were inked by Max Klotfelter, but it was all taken from elements uh, from other cartoonists, other things. Some of, some of them I knew, some of them I didn't. This is for a project uh, with a friend. So these ridiculous characters. Um, and, you know, I sort of fantasized about becoming like a, uh, like a human clip art machine or, or actually kind of like these AI programs that are popping up uh, and sort of taking over uh, uh, you know, much to my dislike, to be honest. Um, so, you know, you could even, you know, the goal, part of the trick with these was, you know, could you integrate it and 
and allow the awkwardness to, to blend together and form a whole new thing. Um, it was definitely part of the exercise as well as having a lot of fun and trying to learn from swiping, you know, back to my mom's suggestion. So, um, so that's a little bit, you know, intro to me um, and what I've done. And so here's, um, here's some stuff to consider in regards to, you know, what is swiping? How do we feel about it? Uh, is it plagiarism? Is it uh, appropriation? Is it homage? If you're here to, to you know, I'm not gonna go on and on with, uh, you know, the, the countless examples of, of famous swipes, but I am gonna share a few, um, you know, for the sake of, of uh, you know, maybe, speaking to my definition of what swiping is, but also maybe this, maybe a new definition that we can come to together here. So I wanted to start with, you know, a few ubiquitous quotes from, you know, famous cartoonists of the 20th century. So starting with Wallace Wood, also known as Wally Wood, um, he infamously said, never draw what you can copy, never copy what you can trace, and never trace what you can cut out and paste down. Uh, it's pretty bold, uh, statement from, you know, one of the, as far as American genre comics goes, I mean, this guy's face is definitely on the Mount Rushmore of that, um, huge, you know, highly, giant influence. He was also, it's worth noting, a, a mentor to a lot of cartoonists that came after, uh, he, he, uh, and they would help him with his work, and, um, he was, very interesting, colorful uh, character, which if you don't know much about him, I, it's worth seeking out. Um, we have another quote from Jack Kirby. He says, I loved Alex Raymond. I swiped from him unmercifully. Alex Raymond was uh, most known for doing the Flash Gordon comic strip, also Rip Kirby. Uh, he's was, was in a lot of ways the artistic uh, parent to uh, the golden age of comics, uh, well into the silver and bronze age. I mean, he just, uh, huge, huge uh, effect on his work. Impossible to not see the lineage uh, in, I mean, I actually have a little bit of a hard time seeing it in Jack Kirby's work, to be honest. And then Joe Simon, who was partners with Kirby, he said, hell yes, we all swiped. And, you know, this kind of gets into Part of the impetus for this, for, you know, for me, my interest in it was that I worked with a cartoonist who one night sent me about 40 emails and they were detailing and showing all these swipes from very famous cartoonists, uh, swiping from other people that came before them. And it was fascinating. I mean, this guy, it was like, a, a, like, like the detective with the string on the wall connecting the dots. I, I was enamored with it. And I, I suggested to the, I'm, I, I'm not gonna name his name because it's not you know, uh, really that important. But um, he, you know, I said to him, I was like, look, I think we should turn this into an article or a paper. I think this is really fascinating. And, and I mean, it was, it was so uh, revelatory and I, I felt very freeing. And, and I also, to see this, um, almost like from, you know, it was almost like this concept of like, well, we're all, we're all the same. We're all part of the same body of, of artists that are, you know, doing this work, um, cartooning or telling picture stories or, you know, whatever, maybe just trying to earn a paycheck. But um, when, you know, I suggested this to him and he was, he said, absolutely not. He said, look, everyone does this. Nobody likes hearing about it. Nobody wants to talk about it, no way. And I respected that. Um, and, uh, uh, but I couldn't leave it alone. I, I, that's part of my character, I suppose. Um, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't help but uh, just dig into it more and become more and more fascinated by it. Almost viewing it as like a phenomenon, especially this, this part of nobody wants to talk about it. And I certainly, have found that to be the case, and maybe you have too, but it's, it's, um, 
there's a lot of, you know, shame that can be associated with swiping or stealing uh, or plagiarism or, or, you know, the very, you know, even, even homage um, can be, can be very shameful, if not deferential. Um, and, you know, for me, it gets into my idea of the cartoonist and, and for me, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in my early 40s and I always saw and thought of a cartoonist as a singular author. Even, even the cartoonists that collaborated with other people, I was only there for the one person, the, the Rob Liefeld, the Jack Kirby, the Todd McFarlane. I, was, I wasn't there for the collaborators. I was there for the, the, like the Wild Stallion. And, um, and as I, you know, continued to stay interested in comics and reading about them, trying to make them, you know, there was, I was looking for the code of, of well, how do you do this? Like, what's, what's legit? What's, what's the right way to make comics? And the message that I got from, you know, predominantly received was, you know, to become a singular voice, uh, you know, one that, um, you know, you do everything. You have no assistance. You you pencil it. You ink it. You letter it. You write it. You color it. Everything. No one else is involved. So, like, you know, when I asked, "What's the what's your idea of the cartoonist?" I just wrote Robert Crumb. I wrote Singular Voice. I wrote Lone Wolf. You know, um, as if you're, you know, not a part of anything uh, other than just yourself. Um, and part of part of swiping that's so fascinating to me is that it is, I I think, one way to look at it is a non-consensual collaboration, especially um, regarding you know the the legacy of swipes. It's usually you know you're swiping people that came before you. Um, that's as I see it most common. So. This is a, another sideways image. And uh, this is a book that I edited for Fantagraphics called Canon by Wallace Wood. And um, if any of this talk is, is interesting or you wanna know more or see the, more stuff, this is a book to seek out. There's a lot of swipes. There are a lot of people involved in this book. Um, Wallace, Wood being, Wallace Wood being the chief author, but a lot of people were, beneath, you know, under him on it. And there was a lot of, you know, it was almost like a, a the whole thing was like a collage, um, which then, so, so this was, you know, working on this book, putting it together only, you know, I was just finding this like alternative idea of the idea of a cartoonist and finding it pretty exciting. I then got really into um, Ken Landgraf's art and, uh, you can even, you know, if you look at this, you can see, you know, there's sort of a, you know, it, it's so, there's like this raw power to it, but there's, there's so much, it almost to me looked like kind of paper dolls that were all collaged together, like, like maybe Henry Darger, who is a, was a folk artist, outsider artist. And I, I just found this to be such a, uh, despite the muscle bound guy and the, Gal, I mean, I found the form of it to be really, it sensitized my eyeballs and, and it vitalized, you know, um, my experience with the work. And um, here's another example um, from Ken. He did a lot of comics that were um, unauthorized biographies during the 90s of musicians. I think this one's, uh, yeah, Pink Floyd. Um, and I'm, I'm very honored to say that I know Ken personally. We've worked together on a couple of things and he's awesome. Um, so that's, you know, kind of getting into my, my interest in this. So here's some examples, right? 1929, Hal Foster, Tarzan. 1939, one of the most famous Batman panels, okay? By Bob Kane or Bill Finger or whoever. Um, we have a Tarzan image. Again, by Hal Foster, like Alex Raymond, probably the, those guys were probably the most swiped artists. Um, and Frank Frazetta. Now, I'm not doing this to make Frank Frazetta look bad. I mean, this is 
clearly a beautiful killer image. Um, it's just it's just more um, uh, I guess my desire to get this in in the mix a little bit more in comics. Here's a panel or frame rather from a silent film called Haxon, uh, sort of a quasi documentary about uh, a, a demon possession, uh, Satanism. It was made in 1922, but released in 1929, which happened to be the first year that Hal Foster really started making comics. Um, a little later in the career, this is I think about not quite 10 years after Haxon, uh, Hal Foster does this Prince Valiant strip, which uh, where Prince Valiant puts on a mask, and uh, for, yeah, thirty-seven to thirty-nine is is roughly when this came out, and it looks you know awful lot like Haxon. So Hal Foster, who you know was uh, sort of at ground zero for American genre comics in the twentieth century, you know he was also looking at other things. Um, Back to Jack Kirby, who's, uh, you know, considered by many to be uh, uh, the primary architect of, you know, popular entertainment as we know it now, superheroes and whatnot. And so, you know, clearly Kirby was also swiping from Hal Foster, not just Alex Raymond. Uh, and, you know, I love both, both these. These are great. Um, here's another Kirby cover, and these are, you know, I'm sharing these, these are, these are the heavies of comics, um, and this one's interesting, this is an anonymous painting, uh, there is a signature here, but I believe no one's been able to attribute it to a single person, but it's most likely a, a, during World War II, they had journalists that painted in the field, um, and this was, uh, you know, something that Kirby was, clearly pulling from. And then you get, you know, this is one of the elephants in the room. Uh, this is Roy Lichtenstein, uh, one of the, probably the next to Andy Warhol, the most representative artist of the pop art movement. Um, here's, here's his source material right here. There's lots of this stuff. Um, and, and what I have found is most cartoonists are pretty, pretty much not into this. Like they're really, this is upsetting. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Lichtenstein uh, made millions of dollars doing this work. Um, and, 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 you know, when we're talking about stealing and swiping, it's, it, I think it's worth considering, you know, the financial, like the, the, the component to that. To, to, to how we feel about it, how we view it, um, you know, just example after example. And, uh, and of course, you know, with someone like Lichtenstein, he's like in a, uh, a lineage of modern artists who have been doing versions of this in various ways, whether it's through collage or through uh, Francis Picabia's paintings where he's like superimposing multiple pre-existing images on top of each other. And, um, you know, this is something that in, you know, fine art, this is something that's been going on for, you know, probably since the twenties, maybe there, there might even be examples of it. I think, you know, maybe in the teens. And, you know, uh, despite the, mainstream legitimacy of these Lichtenstein uh, paintings, it uh, doesn't mean the artists that he swiped from were, were approving or happy about it. You know, here's a comic that Russ Heath uh, made near the end of his life and it's heartbreaking. It's about how he's uh, struggling to pay the bills and he can't afford a bottle of wine. Um, and he's, you know, considering the uh, Lichtenstein painting that was taken from a couple of his drawings and how it sold for $4 million. Um, he's also sharing his gratitude for uh, an organization that helped him uh, get by. So, 
you know, as much as I might be pro swipe or I might have my take on it, it's I think really uh, worth noting that not everybody's uh, on board for this. Um, here's, you know, an example of something. This is from 1930. This is a collage by Hannah Hawk, who's one of the, you know, one of the, the, the big dogs of collage work. Um, very influential. Uh, she, um, you know, and here she is working with source material. I chose this image because it's, you know, it's complex on a, on, in a number of ways, some which she might not have intended at all. It's called uh, Indian Dancer. It's from 1930. <clears throat> She's pulling from 1929 film, The Passion of Joan of Arc. Um, she's a, you know, it's important to note, she's a female artist in a, in a male dominated field making her mark. Um, it's also worth noting that she is, you know, appropriating from native culture with, you know, uh, part of the, what's obscuring or, or laid on top of Rene Falconetti's visage is uh, pulled from, you know, uh, indigenous art source. And, uh, and that's a whole other talk <clears throat> that you can get into because that was something that was not uh, uncommon at all with, um, you know, so-called modern art, fine art, um, UK. I gotta say, this is very, very strange not being in the same room with everyone. So, um, all right, so in the, in the chat, there's a PDF of this article from the Comics Journal, February, 1986, and this is- um, Could I ask you, could you maybe just resend that just so that it's the, the, so that people don't have to scroll through the chat if, they, if you want sure. to? Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, let me figure out that. Where's that chat? So this, this article <clears throat> is, um, it's from 1986 and it regard, it's regarding, um, I'm also going to upload another article that, um, by Ralph Waldo Emerson on Shakespeare. Um, so let's see, share screen. I hope this isn't too dry, but I, this is, I think a, a kind of a heavy, it does, it demonstrates a lot <clears throat> of what, you know, the, the things that are beyond just the, the surface or the form of cartooning and swiping, it gets into, I think, maybe unintentionally on, on Mark Burberry, Burbe, the author's part. Um, but, but a lot of things that I find myself contending with, and, and maybe you do too, if you make comics or if you read them and notice, you know, wonder about, you know, the, the, the maybe the more social ephemera that's uh, coming along and, uh, you know, with the reading or the making. Um, so in this article, Mark, Mark, this is a real, you know, this was a big scoop. This is a real gotcha article. And, um, if you want more of that, uh, there's a Facebook group, I think simply called Comic Swipes. And it's, 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 it's incredible. It's, and it's very, it's pretty civilized for, for, I think they've kind of worn out the, the like, hey, look at this guy, what an idiot. You know, look what he did. How did he think he could get away with that? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty civilized um, forum. Um, and there's a lot of stretches I, I find on that forum as well, but, um, but this is this is uh, this article again came out in 1986. So you know we just looked at collage from 1930. You know we're clearly there's the Roy Lichtenstein pieces from 19 uh, from the 1960s. So appropriation, stealing, swiping, homaging. I mean it's in the mainstream. I mean it's something that is is widely accepted, and it is part of the fine art vernacular of. Of, of America as well as Europe. Um, <clears throat> so here we are with the comics community of 1986. And I think this is pretty representative of uh, 
of how people thought, especially felt about swiping. Um, and I encourage you to yeah, download this and read it. It's a little blurry, sorry about that, but um, I, you know, I've highlighted a few things that I, I you know, and obviously you see in this, on the screen share here, on the top, panel that's by an artist named Keith Giffen and on the bottom panel that's by an artist named Jose Munoz. Keith Giffen's an American cartoonist started in the 70s uh, uh, very much a, a work for hire artist uh, primarily for DC Comics. He did a lot of things with like the Legion of Superheroes among others I and mean, he also worked for Marvel Comics doing the Defenders. I mean he was he was a cog in the wheel of the big you know, the big popular entertainment machines. Uh, Jose Munoz is a very well-regarded, highly thought of cartoonist out of Argentina. Uh, he was, uh, it's worth noting, he was a, um, uh, he was mentored by Alberto Breccia. I think I've got that right. Um, his work, however stylized you see this in the next pages, this, there's a lineage to this as well. Um, that is not something that just uh, erupted out of Munoz. Of course it did erupt out of him, but there are other authors uh, that, are, um, that, that have an influence. Um, but as you can see, you know, Giffen is, is clearly taken from Munoz. And this is a, Admittedly, especially for 86, this is a weird move. Uh, Munoz's style, I mean, this is not something that uh, American comic book fans were necessarily on board for, like just stylistically. Um, and they didn't care about, you know, Munoz and his reputation. Uh, a lot of people weren't, were not happy with what Giffen was doing, just not that he was stealing, because they didn't know that, but but aesthetically, they thought it was, was no good. Um, Mark Burbe thought it was good. He was really into it. And part of his scorn uh, that fuels this article is that he feels that he's been uh, hoodwinked. Um, but you know, he starts out by making sure you know that uh, early on, Giffen's art always struck me as being like Jack Kirby's with all the edges polished down to a nub. His art was boring, almost to the point of being annoying. So, you know, I mean, the column's called Opening Shots. He's stirring it up. The comics journal where this was printed is known for, you know, at that time, especially muckraking journalism. So, um, but, you know, he goes on to say when Giffen came up with this new style, he thought it was incredibly refreshing. Uh, it looked like Giffen was uh, being influenced by Alex Toth. And uh, so he was really on board for that Toth-like influence, right? Um, he also noted that as he was following Giffen's career, each subsequent job he turned in took the new style a step further, combining elements of the avant-garde, of surrealism, and realism. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, and minimalism. So clearly, Burbe has a vocabulary that echoes, you know, uh, or, or is adjacent to the history of fine art, which, you know, as far as the avant-garde and surrealism is concerned, those guys were swiping left and right. So I can't help but wonder uh, Burbe's exposure to that material or, or pop art. I mean, this stuff was everywhere. So his, his incredulity here is a little surprising to me. Um, and go to the next page. So here's, you know, again, more examples. Excellent. This one kind of goes across the spread, um, but, um, but, you know, Burbay then has this real turnaround. He finds out that perhaps the catalyst for Giffen's stylistic metamorphosis is it's just a frog. As, you know, and, 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 you know, regardless of maybe Burbe's exposure to, you know, what's actually avant-garde and surrealist, he's, he's great with language. He, he does a beautiful job of tearing down Giffen uh, and shaming him throughout the article. Um, and, you know, here we go. He says, 
he thought that he was disheartened to learn that this was something I had thought was new and original and indicative of true artistic development had been shamelessly stolen from another art artist's body of work. Um, he then goes on to explain who Munoz is, that he collaborates with another uh, writer and uh, Venez I'm sorry, Venezuelans uh, who respectively draw and script comics set in New York. Neither Munoz, based in Milan and Geneva, nor Simpayo, based in Barcelona, have ever been to the US. So that's kind of interesting. Where are they getting their material from? What are they drawing from? Well, uh, backgrounds, I'm very familiar with that work. Backgrounds appear very accurate. It's incredible they, they you know, capture what New York's like having never been there. Are they swiping? Um, Burbe also, to, to pump up Munoz, likens his work uh, as sort of a cartoon uh, form of Martin Scorsese, filmmaker, or John Schlesinger. Now he's, you know, a classic move in comics is, is to, to prove that something is legit, you tie it to something outside of comics, something more popular, movie, art, film. So there could have been an opportunity to connect what Giffen was doing to Lichtenstein. Um, he then goes on to, um, to give example after example of, you know, he catalogs Giffen's swipes. Um, at one part moment, he kind of takes a pause um, and points out how Giffen was interviewed and he was sharing how happy he was to make deadlines uh, and he was laughing dur during the interview, but, but Burbe couldn't help but wonder if, uh, if Giffen is still laughing or if he'd still agree with that statement, seeing as how Burbe's taken him down. He's, he's revealed Giffen's, you know, uh, crime. Um, he writes, all told, I counted a minimum of 70 swipes spread out among eight comics with 28 swipes in ambush number one alone. And these are only the ones I found in the issues I personally had. I'm missing a couple of the action comics backup stories. I've no doubt that there are further swipes I've overlooked, but after many hours of flipping through Alex Sinner, the work that uh, is by Munoz, and these various comics, I had enough cross-referencing and found myself wishing I could just enter the entire batch of books into a computer and let the machine sort it all out. I couldn't help but think of the AI that we're seeing, the Terminator art, where that's exactly what we're doing is we're feeding images, comics, cartoons into the computer and it's spitting out, you know, uh, a rather inhuman uh, representation of the imagination, if you ask me. But, um, but despite him being exhausted, he couldn't help it. So he said, but I wasn't finished yet. There was still Hell on Earth, adapted from Robert Block's short story to contend with. Now, for me, he writes, for me, let me get to the next page. Um, is that right? Yeah. For me, this prestigiously mounted graphic novel, the first in DC's new line of science fiction and horror adaptations of major authors, represents an important step in terms of the graphic story in America. Hell on Earth is very much the kind of book which could lead the way to more innovative, mature literary uses of the medium. It's a healthy sign that some people in the industry are serious about doing something besides superheroes, although Mark is still missing those issues of action comics, so I wonder if he ever got them. Um, I had hoped that Giffen would see it more than just another job. I had hoped that he would come to his senses and put a stop to this gross misappropriation of another man's creativity. No such luck. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, he goes on, you know, a lot lower on this page, he extols the virtues of comics, which he and I are, agree with very much. He thinks that comics are the formally the greatest, most potent art form. Um, and he points out that a lot of this is due to uh, the sheer diversity and in individual styles that makes comics art so intrinsically and uniquely exciting. Uh, the field may seem limited and stunted if you consider the Kirby and Neil Adams imitators alone, 
but not when you begin to compile a mental list of your personal favorites, which he then does in the second column. Um, because I could go on for hour, each of these names and the dozens more I failed to mention represents a one of a kind talent and style of art and what validates their work, what makes it so worthy of our attention and admiration, what legitimizes any piece of art, comic or otherwise, is the fact that it is the product of a single creative force. So, you know, when I had my idea of, you know, the cartoonist, uh, I'd never read this and that perfectly, you know, spells out, you know, I wake up every morning thinking that even still, um, you know, that it's, that it's this single creative force that's that's the, the right way, that's the legitimate way, that's how you're gonna get ahead. Um, that, that there's, you know, what I hear when I read that out loud is that there's no way working with others could, could do that, you know, could, could be uh, uh, worthy of our attention. Some of the irony is that the names he lists are people that are working with others working with other people's ideas, uh, literally working with other people. Um, some of them are drawing on model, which means there's images supplied for them to reference directly, um, you know, to keep things looking consistent. Um, he then, you know, continues on uh, pointing out some examples of cartoonists who he sees as one of a kind, but yes, they did start imitating someone else, but that's, that led to uh, the eventual emergence of something completely independent of it, giving birth to something new, unique in its own right. Sure, yeah. Um, what threatens to make comics dull is the enforcement of a single style, the imposition of a single approach. What continues to make them so engaging is the artist's refusal to remain bound by formula and his need to finally break free and assume his true shape and identity. Wow. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just me being me, but I, the enforcement of a single style or a single approach, I, I, to me, that's a challenge. Um, and one that I think Giffen is, is, I don't know what he was doing. I don't know why he was doing it. Uh, but I think the work, you know, for me, to my relative experience, it, it challenges that. Um, because, you know, as, as this article gets closed out, um, you know, the author even, you know, he talks about, you know, he, he genuinely liked what Giffen was doing. Um, he later, uh, you know, goes on to say um, that he will continue to follow and buy, even enjoy Giffen's work because despite the knowledge that he's selling stolen goods, I like what he's selling. It's so unlike anything else in American comics that I would only be, depri be depriving myself by boycotting it. Um, yeah, I mean, on this page here, we see him, uh, he, he kind of gives, he calls, you know, Giffen a, the worst sort of blood sucking vampire, uh, artistically speaking, uh, he says, artistically speaking, Giffen is, is headed in the right direction. The trouble with Giffen is that he seems unable to distinguish between inspiration and theft. Munoz shows a variety of influences ranging from sundry post-impressionist painters to Pablo Picasso and Alvin Albright. So, you know, Burbank's clearly, he knows some fine artists. Um, he, he adds some others in there, which I actually find suspicious. Uh, Tom Sutton, Gahan Wilson, Gary Painter, Pat Boyette. I'm not sure that's, <coughs> those are figures that Munoz is paying much attention to. Um, uh, he says that, uh, this, you know, Nate lists those names and it says, uh, bear certain stylistic similarities to Munoz, either through direct influence or merely by coincidence or perhaps shared influences. Um, so I don't know, I, I, what I'm, I guess we're, we're coming up on the hour. Um, what I'm interested in is what, what's the difference between, 
uh, shared influences, you know, pulling from, uh, uh, you know, is it how you pull? Is it what you pull? Um, um, I'm gonna, for the sake of time, and and I'm just gonna, I encourage you guys to to check out the, the Emerson Shakespeare essay. Um, some highlights uh, are that um, a, a general overview, maybe for some people that have already read it, is that Emerson, he thinks Shakespeare is the greatest and, and he acknowledges just like Burbay does, he even goes into the, the number of times Shakespeare, you know, was working from directly other people's, um, you know, source materials. Like there's an instance where it's cataloged that, um, that in uh, you know Hen Henry the uh, Henry the fifth out of six hundred and forty three lines, one thousand seven hundred and seventy one were written by some author preceding Shakespeare. So I mean, this is from nineteen from eighteen fifty. Uh, so Emerson's take on this is is closer to my own. I, I I regret getting covering the other stuff so long because he what he really gets into is that it's that that he doesn't see the theft. He doesn't see the, uh, he sees that as being part of a larger body, part of a larger project of, 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 you know, what it is to be alive, what it is to comment on our times, to, to what it is to share the song of our experience. And that he, he does not see that as a singular or a single-minded pursuit. Um, he, he sees that as a uh, collaboration. Um, and um, and let's see real quick. And Jason, if you want to, you don't, don't worry too much about finishing on the hour. If you want to get into your thoughts on, on the, the Emerson piece or, or anything that you haven't gotten to yet, don't, don't worry about ending things too quickly. Okay. So, I mean, he, Emerson's a, a hell of a writer, very interesting thinker. Um, he says, you know, he starts this out by saying, great men are more distinguished by range and tent than by originality. If we require the originality, which consists in weaving like a spider, their web from their own bowels in finding clay and making bricks and building the house, no great men are original. Says the greatest genius is the most indebted man. A poet is no rattle brain, saying what comes uppermost, and because he says everything, saying at last something good, but a heart in unison with his time and country. The world was, as far as the population goes, right? I mean, this is post-industrial revolution, but the world was was not nearly as pop, you know, populated as it is now. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that despite the, you know, almost Christian kind of hippie um, energy behind what Emerson, you know, is going into. Um, yeah, some highlights. Let's see. Um, great genial power, and he's meaning artistic power, potency, resonance. Great genial power, one would almost say, consists in not being original at all and being altogether receptive and letting the world do all and suffering the spirit of the hour to pass unobstructed through the mind. So he's talking about getting into a state of ego deflation. Um, and he's, you know, you know, part of what he's proposing is that that's contingent on, you know, not like, like being a part of the lineage like that there's that we're all related and that we're it's not theft it's it's all part of a, a, a collaborative project and you know again worth pointing out that um you know i things are a little different now than they were then uh i'm not sure people were making a whole lot of money but but people took this stuff very seriously um uh, which, which, you know, we'll get into. He says, um, 
At one point he says, <clears throat> all the mass has been treated with more or less skill by every playwright and the prompter has the soiled and tattered manuscripts. So somebody's got these, but we don't know where they are. It is no longer possible to say who wrote them first. Now he's speaking about plays that Shakespeare had a hand in developing and, and Emerson, he really thinks that, you know, Shakespeare, what he did is, is sort of hit this harmonic ideal with the plays. Like he, he became the poet of humankind. Um, but that these, you know, works have been the property of the theater so for so long, and so many rising geniuses have enlarged or altered them, inserting a speech or a whole scene or adding a song, adding a song that no man can any longer claim copyright in this work of numbers. Happily, no man wishes to. It's kind of, I think, a bold statement. I'm not sure how he knew that. I wasn't there, but it suggests an alternative to, um, you know, American rugged individualism, you know. Um, he, something he gets into, which I thought rereading this was really exciting, was he says that the poet needs a ground in popular tradition on which he may work and which again may restrain his art within the due temperance. It holds him to the people, supplies a foundation for his edifice and in furnishing so much work done to his hand, leaves him at leisure and in full strength for the audiences of his imagination. In short, the poet owes to his legend what sculpture owed to the temple. Sculpture in Egypt and in Greece grew up in subordination to architecture. It was the ornament of the temple wall. At first a rude relief carved on pediments then the relief became bolder and a head or an arm was projected from the wall. So, you know, the picture that's getting painted here is that, you know, everything's housed within this temple or within this pyramid and everything's emerging from this like central force, you know, which Emerson has various names for, uh, or images for like, you know, temple, pyramid, uh, uh, popular tradition. Um, he then goes on to say, though, that as soon as the statue was begun for itself and with no reference to the temple or palace, the art began to decline. Freak, extravagance, and exhibition took the place of the old temperance. This balanced wheel, which the sculpture found in architecture, the perilous irritability of poetic talent found in the accumulated dramatic materials to which the people were already wanted, and which had a certain excellence, which no single genius, however extraordinary, could hope to create. And um, that's, that's pretty harsh, if you ask me. Um, uh, he goes, you know, he goes on to sort of, uh, through the essay, similar to the Burbay piece, where he's pointing out examples of, of uh, but in no way is he diminishing the resonance of Shakespeare or he could, talks about Chaucer. Chaucer was also a great borrower. Um, so was Plutarch. I mean, all, all the heavies. Um, uh, he, um, as he's going back to Chaucer, he talks about how he steals by this apology that what he takes has no worth where he finds it and the greatest where he leaves it. It has come to be practically a sort of rule in literature that a man having once shown himself capable of original writing is entitled thenceforth to steal from the writings of others at discretion. So this, you know, any poetry fans out there know that it was a common practice for a poet to write a poem called Milton or Chaucer and then, or Shakespeare, and then basically write in their style. Um, you see this in hip hop. Also, you know, talk about swipes. Uh, there's a lot of um, flexing and a lot of, um, you know, trying to show the level at which someone is at or, or using that, those pre existing levels as jumping off points. Um, but he says, a certain awkwardness marks the use of borrowed thoughts. But as soon as we have learned what to do with them, they become our own. So for me in there, I have to come clean and say that I'm pretty 
excited by the awkwardness of the borrowed thought, you know. I mean, I, at this point, I'm a little less interested in the, um, you know, the thing becoming its own separate thing. I, I, I've, awkwardness to me, you know, is, is, is akin to the uh, apparent malfunction of democracy. You know, it's not something that's smooth or, or uh, you know, it's, it, by its appearance isn't always pretty. Um, and, you know, we, we're in a time where uh, the acceptance of the, you know, all the warts and all, all of what we think about others and what they think about us is, is, is pretty divisive. Um, um, Emerson continues to say, thus all originality is relative. You may disagree. Um, and, you know, he, he wrote this in 1850. Um, he, he goes on, he, he gets into the, uh, for him, he felt that Shakespeare somehow managed it. He had no ego. There was no discoverable egotism. The great he tells greatly, the small subordinately. He is wise without emphasis or assertion. He is strong as nature is strong. So, you know, he's, he's this product of, of, you know, he's like, you know, I mean, Emerson definitely calls upon biblical imagery, like Corinthians of like the one, the one body, many parts. And, and he sees Shakespeare as somebody who really congealed and, and, and respected the, 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 the many parts as much as the body, like to, to like an elemental degree. And that involved borrowing, taking, reconfiguring. Um, he says, this makes the equality of power and farce, tragedy, narrative, and love songs a merit so incessant that each reader is incredulous of the perception of other readers. And I believe what he's getting at there is that they're, they would be shocked to find that other people had a different opinion about the thing, despite originality being relative. Now, I can't help but wonder if some of this essay was prompted by the Astor Place riots. So March 10th, 1849, year before this essay came out, there was a dispute in New York, right? Astor Place Theater, New York. There was a dispute over an American actor's rendition of Shakespeare versus a British actor's rendition of Shakespeare. And both these actors, nobody remembers their names, but they were like the heavies, you know? They were like big, they were a big deal on both sides of the continent. Or, uh, of the water. Um, you know, when the dust settled from this riot over Shakespeare, uh, it, they don't know the final tally of the dead, but it was, it was over 20 and under 30. Uh, there were 120 people injured. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty intense. That uh, uh, suggests that there's something really um, essential to humankind being grappled with here. And, and it's interesting to me because it's interpretations of another man's work, right? Shakespeare, who was interpreting uh, the work of other people. Um, and it turned pretty ugly. Um, yeah, and I, I guess... Um, Yeah, he, the fine, I'll just, I'll close with this with, Shakespeare, with, with Emerson and Shakespeare. He says, the finest poetry was first experience, okay? Wasn't poetry at all, it was just experience. But the thought has suffered a transformation since it was an experience. Something happened. Cultivated men often attain a good degree of skill in writing verses, but it is easy to read through their poems, their personal history. Anyone acquainted with the parties may name every figure. This is Andrew, and that is Rachel. The sense thus remains prosaic. It is a caterpillar with wings and not yet a butterfly. So he's getting into how there's a lot of poets out there, but they're not making their experience universal. They're not, you know, they're just getting stuck with their private personal associations. 
which is maybe what I'm doing right now, I don't know. In the poet's mind, the fact has gone quite over into the new element of thought and has lost all that is exuvial, which means to cast off the skin. This generosity abides with Shakespeare. We say from the truth and closeness of his pictures that he knows the lesson by heart, yet there is no trace of egotism. And there's a lot to unpack there that uh, uh, if you write down the name Samuel Coolridge, who also addressed a lot of, a lot of this, um, not just Shakespeare, but just what, what are we doing when we, we make things and, and how are we dealing with experience, which is also to say, how are we dealing with pre-existing materials? Um, so this is how I, this strip you've seen here now on the, yeah, I'm still sharing. Uh, it's called Dead Boys. This is a collaboration with um, Tim Goodyear. And I would also say it's a collaboration with Stefano Gaudiano. Uh, it's also a collaboration with uh, all the artists that I swiped from. There's not a single image here that um, is not taken from someone else. I, I really wanted to see if I could do a comic that was made completely of swipes. Um, I think Burbay or even Emerson could suggest that this turned into its own weird butterfly. That's not for me to say. Um, this is um, uh, started out as uh, wanting to make a, a comic that I thought would be financially lucrative. I had just left my job to go to freelance work and I thought I could tap into the zeitgeist of criminal you know, crime comics. There's so much great crime fiction. Where are all the great crime comics? There's a couple really great ones, but where are they? And so I set about to do a crime comic. And um, this is probably, I thought this was the third draft, but really I was looking over through my files. This is about the sixth or seventh draft of this comic. It first started out with me trying to draw it on my own, uh, all by myself. Uh, and then I brought in my friend, Tim. Uh, I still couldn't get it down. I then started trying to actively swipe to just get my way through it. That wasn't working. I then went to my friend, Stefano Gaudiano, fantastic person, wonderful artist, beautiful thinker. And uh, he was reading it and he started to pull out this, um, uh, you know, he was able to see the story and he, he, he started talking about connecting it to, you know, the different characters and their time period to what was going on in comics. So there's a, a narrator of this story who's a, who'd be World War II uh, generation. So he'd be kind of, you'd be reading Dick Tracy. And then there would be, uh, you know, he's kind of dealing with the younger crowd. So that could be represented by like underground comics or the work done by Jack Kirby, the 60s comics, which that could sort of blend in between. So the idea then, I, to me, when he started going off on this, I it like just got super excited to try to turn pre-existing um, images into vocabulary. And I'm, you know, I've come to find out, I wasn't thinking about doing anything original. Others have done this, uh, especially in the fine arts. Um, but, um, yeah, so, and I also thought, well, it's a crime comic, then I should probably be stealing, you know, be true to the, be true to the crime. And, um, um, so I also, you know, the, the, the voiceover or the narration in the comic isn't necessarily stolen, but it's, a it's a story that I took from Law and Order, uh, about a, uh, security guard at a college during the 60s. Um, he was watching the, you know, <clears throat> the counterculture, the hippies uh, protest the Vietnam War. Um, he had a son that was in the Vietnam War who was killed. Um, he has to kind of put up with watching all these protests, uh, which he feels completely at odds with. And he finds himself at the wrong place at the wrong time with one of the hippies. 
and he snaps and he murders the hippie and he uh you know disposes of the body which is then found years later and it comes right back to him and he finds out that the hippie was not a hippie but a cia agent who was implanted into the hippie movement to amp up their protests uh, in order to make them look uh, more extreme. The thought there being that the extreme actions of the counterculture would put off the majority of America. And in, in many ways it did. Um, now, did this story happen exactly? Well, no, uh, probably not but it's not without basis in fact. And, you know, this was a story that really grabbed a hold of me and I didn't know why. And it wasn't, wasn't really until after I finally finished it through the help of my friends and through the help of my unwitting, unknowing collaborators that I recognized that this was for me uh, more personal than I, I ever thought. Um, I was raised in part by my grandfather, who was a FBI agent, um, and he was uh, of some repute in that organization. And, um, you know, there are a lot of things that I know and a lot of things I don't know about what he did. And um, what's interesting is over the years since he's passed away, more and more things have come out about what he was involved with. And, one of the organizations he was involved with or, uh, was called COINTELPRO, which was a four decade campaign, initially instigated by J. Edgar Hoover, my grandfather's boss, who he at times directly reported to. Um, but it was an organization to discredit dissidents, whether they be black dissidents, whether they be communists, you know, anything that the powers that be didn't like. Um, and they did some pretty nasty stuff. And, you know, he's my grandpa. It's a little, it's a little hard to swallow um, that he could have been involved with some of this stuff. And I choose to believe, having made this comic, that unconsciously that was, that was kind of part of the, the trouble I was having with completing this, with seeing it through. Um, and I see no coincidence that I asked for help from someone who was a contemporary of mine and someone who's older than me. And then through all these artists that were much older than me, um, I, I think it was, I choose to believe that this was, uh, um, you know, that this piece is like, you know, many parts, one body and trying to figure out what the hell happened. And so the story, you know, we'll just go through it. Um, just, just scroll through it and you can see, you know, there's Dick Tracy imagery, um, Gilbert Shelton. There's, there's a morphing of the two. Um, I, these all started from collages that I made with the pre-existing work and then um, and then I did uh, I guess you'd say tracings or drawings of those in my own hand that, that, that seemed to be necessary. Here's Tim saying let's go do some crime comics which is a maybe not so subtle uh, echo of a line from the movie Repo Man <laughs> um, but here we have a famous you know, Robert Crumb imagery, the Furry Freak Brothers, there's a Crumb cover. This, um, you know, this is a draft notice, which I, I copied, traced. Um, this here is a, a little app, or a little, <laughs> this is a Al Cap drawing, um, who was a, a very much uh, anti-hippie. He thought they were very silly. Um, here are, you know, I didn't take just from comics. Also, you know, these were protest posters. Um, now here's where the old man starts to talk about his boy. So he's represented by Dick Tracy's adopted son. And uh, 
gets into him dying over there. POW, here we have, he says, listening to this shit. And here's on TV, you've got John Lennon and Yoko. And, you know, people are pissed, everyone's pissed off. And so, you know, here we have Captain America. So part of the story was that, and this did happen, I, I, I did trace this, where they would take blood, typically pig's blood, and they would use that to splash onto monuments, probably some of the monuments that have since been torn down. Um, here we have spy versus spy, CIA. Uh, and all the writing, you know, I will say that is all generated by me, but also with in mind of the law and order thing, uh, unconsciously, you know, hearing stories from my grandfather, my own reading, and my own experience. Um, here we have an, a Robert Crumb drawing. This is sort of him doing a, a Charles Manson figure. And here's the pouring the blood on the monument. This is Captain America. There's an Alfred E. Newman kind of, you know, juxtaposed to the American flag. Here's a folding of the flag. Um, very important in uh, our culture after a soldier has been killed. Um, if you've ever lost a loved one that was in the military, you'll find that uh, you can receive one of these folded flags, whether killed in action or not. Um, yeah. So here he is, you know, this is, this is where he cracks. And he, he attacks the, the hippie. This is from Zap Comics. Here's Captain America punching at the, uh, these sort of, uh, you know, uh, famous images taken from Crumb's famous poster, Stoned Again. And part of the story, he says, is that I hit this, you know, I hit him over and over again, again, again. And Crumb's lettering again. Here I call out my, my friend uh, who helped me out, Stefano. He's the wheel man. He helped me get away. Um, and as he talks about, I got away with it. And, uh, and I sort of felt at the end of this, this last page that I got away with it. Um, and I, you know, start to visually steal from, uh, you know, here's this hand. This is uh, from Watchmen, more contemporary, more my era. Um, and it ends with a Watchmen swipe saying the end is nigh. So yeah, probably, I guess ended there. I, I um, yeah. What do you think, Austin? You tell me. That's, I think that's a perfect uh, jumping off point to, <laughs> to have people okay. ask some questions. And thank you so much. That was beautiful. Uh, it was just beautiful seeing that um, that comic at the end. And um, I, I, as you went through your talk, I um, actually have a, a bunch of personal questions about like questions for me, but let's, um, um, let's get into audience questions first. And um, if you guys have questions, um, if, if anyone who didn't type their questions into chat has one, um, you can do, I, I can ask you to do two things. You can either maybe just put your name, uh, in the chat and say that you want to ask a question out loud, um, or just type your question in and I'll read it. Um, I'm, I, I see two questions here. Uh, the first from, uh, Jesse McManus. Now, let me just ask, Jesse, do you want to read this out loud or uh, would you like me to read it? You can just say in the chat. Um, I'm not, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, Jesse wants me to read the question. So um, Jesse McManus asked Jason, um, could Jason speak a little bit about scale? Um, he's made some of the smallest and biggest comics I own. The swipers he's spoken of worked in the comic book format but Lichtenstein didn't. Um, is there a, a perfect format or are we still developing it? And if I could just add on to that, I mean, you know, talking about um, um, swiping visual work uh, in any way, I mean, it's the, the format, the paper texture uh, and the scale, um, you know, that, that rarely uh, stays the same unless you're making a complete facsimile. So that's, I, if, if you wanna to respond to that, Jason. Uh, well, I mean, I think that's, I mean, that the question to me is kind of starts to 
I start to percolate like, well, what's, yeah, what's the difference when you, when you, uh, like I have the originals to those right here, but like, you know, here's the, this is 11 by 17. And, you know, here's this Jack Kirby, Captain America cover. And I remember, you know, as I was tracing, I had to interpret because of the way this, the scale, you know, I guess deformed the original. Like it, it, it suddenly became more in a, like I, as I was tracing it, I was thinking, oh boy, I don't know if this is gonna read. Like, is this gonna, are, are people gonna be able to tell? And I just thought, well, I'm just gonna have faith that they, that it will, and it, and it does. Um, it leaves an impression. So yeah, scale, um, I mean, it's worth pointing out, I think those, the, the Roy Lichtenstein paintings, I mean, he hand painted all the dots that were part of the mechanical uh, printing process. Like the coloring would be translated into these dot patterns that would, you know, uh, evoke the color, um, you know, like if it was like a, a blue shirt, it would be made up of these dots. And so, yeah, I don't, I mean, that's, I mean, to me, yeah, scale has a huge um, uh, influence or effect or, you know, results in an interesting effect, but I'm not sure if, if that has um, anything specific to do with swiping. I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe part of the reason Lichtenstein or, or I, like there's the artist Cause who also is a prolific swiper and works large, I believe. I mean, maybe that's part of the, the, you know, comics and cartoonists being upset about the appropriation. Maybe it's because that's a really big heist, you know, like it's such a big deal because the art itself is so huge. The money involved is so huge. Um, yeah. I am, uh, but the next question we have is from someone named uh, Blaze Moritz. Now, Blaze, would you like to um, read this out loud or would you like me to read it? I'm just gonna go in and, and, and read it for you. And this is, um, uh, Blaze is, is kind of just offering, um, here, let's see what he says here. Um, yeah, it's 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 more of a it's more of a comment, but it might it's it's definitely something worth um, hearing you respond to because uh, it's it's kind of a um, um, it's kind of a counter to to the Emerson um, discussion, and it's a comment Joni Mitchell has made about Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan and some instances of disillusionment she felt on finding the relationship between some of their lyrics and other works of literature, uh, and this is her quote. Life is fair game, but books are not. That's my personal opinion. Don't steal from somebody else's art. That's cheating. Steal from life. It's up for grabs, right? So does that, uh, would you like to respond to oh, that? Oh, yeah. Pretty, pretty <clears throat> loaded, loaded comment. Oh, it's great. Yeah, no, I mean, I love it. It's, it's um, yeah, I mean, Emerson too was also, I mean, I don't know what kind of uh, woundedness I mean, I know a little bit having read biographies, um, but he, he clearly was somebody who's, who, who had an issue with boundaries. You know, maybe it was from losing his wife at a young age. I, I, I don't know, but he infamously uh, gave a lecture, I believe the title of which was Self-Reliance to a graduating class of Harvard. And this is when Harvard was, of course, all white men and boys, uh, Harvard, you know, the age range was like fifth grade to 12th grade or, 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 or into four years of college. And I mean, it was just a hive of white men. People would hate it now. Um, and, you know, he, he infamously uh, really disrespected the whole concept of the book. He told, you know, he was basically trying to encourage the student body to pay attention to their experience, you know, that, that not just, not just like academic stuff or knowledge or, you know, and, and he gets into that and that, you know, to Blaze, I hope you, I hope you check out that the Emerson Shakespeare thing. Cause he, 
there's some really interesting overlap. And, and also it's funny because when I would be rereading it, I thought at times that Emerson's writing sounded like Bob Dylan lyrics. Um, definitely a dreamer, but um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly, a, I mean, I'm not here to tell anyone that, um, that swiping is right or wrong. I, I, I'm not here to, to validate that or to invalidate that. Um, I do think it's interesting that I'm not sure if it came across in, in going over the Burbank piece, but I certainly felt very snarky and very like, oh, I'll show you. And I think that's, um, I'll show you, meaning to, to Burbank, you know, I'll, I'm going to, you put Giffen down, I'm going to put you down. And that's not because I have any allegiance to Giffen. I'm, I'm a fan of his work. I think it's also, let's, um, if you don't know Giffen's work, check it out because it is, it is, he's a restless artist who worked in many different styles. Um, he's almost like a, in that way, like a David Hockney of cartooning where, you know, he did not just, you know, he not just stick to one way of drawing and then polish that for the entirety of his career. Um, that said, the Munoz article is, has dogged him for his career. Um, the shaming, the public shaming that he got has, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I mean, Munoz was not, you know, my understanding is that he wasn't super happy that Giffen was doing this. In fact, there's a, one of the center stories, he, in one of the stories, there's a doppelganger of, of the cartoonist that shows up and, and they kill him. And it's, and it's clearly Giffen. You know, there's even a reference to Ambush Bug, which was the bizarre comic that Giffen was, you know, making at the time. So, um, yeah, it, it, um, I, I guess I just want to try to maybe, what I'm trying to share, and I'm not sure if I'm doing, a, I, I'm not sure I'm doing a great job of it, but I think there's another way to look at this, like the idea of originality, the, the, um, I don't know what Blaze's or anyone else's idea of the cartoonist is, but but for me, I can say that uh, my experience has been, as I have consciously tried to chase after that, you know, single-minded, uh, you know, this, you know, this, I'm going to do everything. It hasn't really helped me out in uh, finishing work, in sharing work, in. Um, receiving benefit from the work. I've, I've actually received the most benefit, I feel personally, uh, whether it's been monetary, but more spiritually and personally from working with others. Um, and that goes for in my life in general. I mean, this comics is just a foil for, for life at large, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, I've, I've um, and you know, working with others is not easy, um, so. Bob Dylan swiped his name. Thank you, Matthew. That's right. <laughs> I'd like to offer just one uh, before we get into there's a there's a good discussion in the chat about about uh, Giffen's um, Giffen's statement about what happened with this incident. Um, I would just like to offer my own as a as a young reader of comics. The first time I encountered Giffen's work was when he was doing breakdowns and and plotting for um, an image comic called Freak Force. And at the time, I wasn't aware of who Giffen was, but when I read this comic, it had such a, a deeper level of storytelling and, and um, was much more involving than maybe other comics I was reading as, as a young person, as a 10-year-old. And so when I hear these discussions of, about what, um, uh, you know, what Giffen did, what he didn't do, what his intentions were, I often think of Giffen as maybe someone where he has a, like, you know, his, his, the way he draws is extremely compelling to me. I... I, I really enjoy his drawing, uh, but I, I often think of him as someone who's just trying to, um, he's trying, he, you know, there's so many comics that Giffen in, is involved in just doing the breakdowns and, and setting up the page for someone to, to finish the pencils. And, I, and those comics often have um, a mark of storytelling distinction that other comics don't have. So I wonder if maybe you think part of Giffen's reasoning for doing this is he's just trying to get a story out and maybe the actual drawing of imagery panel to panel is an impediment to some degree and he needs to 
he needs some tool and this i'm not defending or endorsing what 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 giffen's doing uh i'm not coming on either side of it but i do think that that might be part of his motivation he has he has visual stories he's trying to tell and he knows the language of the sequencing he knows the language of of how the page is gonna gonna be meted out panel by panel, but what to put in those panels is maybe less important. The the actual mark making is less important to him. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's a really I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, and, you know, pushing the 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 swipe work up against you know the the where he's just doing layouts. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I love that it, it, when I, when I try to hold his body of work, you know, as I'm trying to like hold the, the layout work or, or the, when he's doing all the drawing, but then, you know, that trencher comic comes in where he's drawing it without any penciling. It's just direct ink. And there's such a, he's like Harold in the purple crayon. You know, there's such a joy of drawing and cartooning in that. That's that is, is missing in, in like a lot of the other stuff that it's just it's just truly, you know, I, for, for me, the whole the entire like, I mean, we could also was using Giffen really merely as an example. He is one of countless. I mean, I could I could have shown you Bernie Wrights and swipes, Frank Frazetta. I mean, just like, you know, but <clears throat> he. Uh, there's a you know you think about the body of his work like as as a whole i mean we're just talking about one little part of it and and i i find that when i try to i don't know like hold the entirety of, of his output which i'm not familiar with everything but i'm familiar familiar with a lot i i start you start getting into some uncanny territory and and i you know and I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe Giffen had some woundedness from when he was young that, you know, made his, uh, uh, you know, sense of boundaries, you know, different from others. I mean, I know I've had that. Um, you know, I've, I have different marks, different lines, you know, than, than I, I know other people do. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, also, what about, you know, he was, he was maybe, he was a cog in a machine. He was like a golden cog in a machine. And so perhaps he's not, perhaps that was like, you know, taking, you know, reducing his ego and opening up the opportunity to, to swipe. Um, I don't know. Well, let's get an Let's get the quote that um, Giffen has about this incident just on the record. And maybe it's um, because especially oh, if, people, if people view the video of this, they won't they won't see the they won't see the chat. So I think it's it's worth reading this. And this is um, Michael Dooley put this in the chat. Um, this is Giffen responding to to the to the work in question. I had a bad inc incident with studying somebody's work very closely at one point. And I resolve never, ever to do it again. I can get so immersed in somebody's work that I start turning into a Xerox machine and it's not good. There was no time I was sitting there tracing or copying, no. Duplicating, pulling out of memory and putting down on paper after intense study, absolutely. And I think uh, Josh Bayer later in the, in the chat here says that it sounds as if uh, Giffen's describing a trauma um, uh, of what he went through. So I, I maybe I'm interested in hearing you respond to, to that quote specifically. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't tracing. <laughs> I don't know. He wasn't copying. I mean, it's pretty brutal, but I mean, that's, that's, um, yeah, maybe he was in some kind of flow state. I, I don't know. I don't, Necessarily, um, I'm finding it, you know, I'm finding it hard not to just go into like, uh, well, do I agree or disagree? Or is it, you know, tr trying to, is there a way to like, I don't know, use nonviolent communication to talk about this? Because I, I, well, I, that's another part of this that really interests me. Is it, for, I don't know what it is about comics because you, 
I've never encountered this reading about Acabia, Lichtenstein, Burroughs, all the all the heavyweights of of literature and fine art that have that have copied. Um, but with comics, it gets into a value judgment very quickly. I mean, at least at least in my own thinking. And I, I feel like there's some kind of iffy wiring there. I don't trust it. Um, and I'm I'm would like to. Uh, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, I maybe just I've been at this for so long, or been looking at this topic for so long that I actually find it depressing that I, I like rereading the Giffen article uh, this morning. I just I felt so depressed that I didn't want to do the talk. I was like, this is depressing, you know, because I just can't not get into like, you know, is what he was doing wrong is what this guy's writing about what he's doing wrong you know it's, it's so um i don't know that's that's um i don't i don't know i don't i don't turning into a xerox machine sounds kind of interesting i mean it, again i'm i'm i feel confronted with my feelings or reactions to the the ai that's being done right now, you know, and there's even, you know, there's been issues already that art directors are feeding uh, names and phrases into AI and using it as illustration. Um, and there's people questioning that. I, I don't know, I'm, I think it's worth pointing out that Burbe felt that despite Giffen's transgressions, he was still going to pay attention to it because he still enjoyed it. And for a guy that was, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a checklist that he provides. You know, you'll see at the end of that article, there's a checklist of all the incidences that he found Giffen swiping. Uh, you know, so, I, you know, there's, there's some contradictions there. Not, not to mention the other contradiction that on the facing page, of that article, the way it ends. This is a little digression, but on the facing page is an ad for a Wonder Woman comic drawn. I mean, it looks like a swipe of Wonder Woman. It's like drawn in a style of, you know, it's this throwback comic. Um, I thought that was kind of ironic, but that, that's a digression. So um, I don't have an answer to your question or even much of a, of a reaction. <laughs> I think we were, just, we were just responding to the to the uh, Giffen to the Giffen response. I want to, um, but related to this, um, and you you addressed some of it, but Peter um, Fe, um, Feke, I'm probably mispronouncing um, Peter's last name, um, but Pete kind of is asking, you know, what what maybe we can define a little bit where swiping goes too far, and on that, um, I don't want I, I don't want us to get bogged down in things that you've already talked about, but I think it's, I think it's telling that, um, you know, in the, the comic you showed at the end, um, it's very clear what your, you know, your intentions are, you know, you're saying that you're committing crimes, doing this, the whole, the whole thing is crime and that there's, that your sources are clear, you're stating the intentions of the whole project. Um, and I'm wondering if for you, if that's your barrier, like, you know, stating, mm. stating the swiping, maybe you don't personally want to go across that barrier. And I know you're not making a value judgment of someone like Giffen, uh, but then you're saying you're reading this and you're getting depressed and you're getting depressed about the, the response to it. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if there might be some barriers that you, that you have, or if you can define where you think it goes too far. And again, it's, I, I think part of what makes your discussion of this interesting is that you don't you, you, it can't be it can't be all tied up like that. I mean, it's much more uh, interesting than that, and there's a lot more layers to what goes too far and what doesn't go too far. But I think we also, you know, we have those responses as well. Like uh, there's there's definitely things that make us uncomfortable and things that don't make us uncomfortable. Well, right. I mean, I I I was not raised Catholic, but I I I can never seem to not confess you know, uh, or, or, or feel like I must atone or make amends for transgressions. Um, and, you know, in my personal experience, um, it's not so clear if it's 
in the art making experience, but in my personal experience, you know, that's been a pathway to, um, that's been sort of my ticket of admission to uh, a power greater than myself, you know? And, and, and what's interesting to me about the working with swipes, very consciously doing it is, uh, and, and, and I mean, yeah, there's definitely like, uh, there's definitely like, you know, part of my motivation in making the Dead Boys strip was, was I'm going to show them, look what you can do, you know, that was definitely in there, but I came on the other side of it feeling a lot closer to artists that came before me, a lot more sympathetic to their time, as well as, you know, to my own family experience and to my grandfather who, you know, um, it became a much more complex person. I mean, he's not here, unfortunately, to, to talk more about, about his involvement, you know, with, with the, the very thing I was making this comic about, but um, I don't know, getting in trouble isn't so bad, you know, or, or I mean, being uncomfortable is, is, is really, for me, it's, 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 I'm constantly, I just feel, you know, it's, 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 it's the pathway to clarity. You know, there's always conflict before clarity. Or, I'm sorry, clarity always follows conflict always, at least that's for me. And, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to believe that I have faith that the awkwardness or the uncomfortability that I'm feeling right now will, you know, I know, I, I do believe that that will result in uh, uh, the clarity, you know, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, there, there's, there's so many different, um, um, <laughs> there's so many different uh, things that people want to weigh in on uh, with this. Um, and I just, I just want to interject one thing that I've talked about some of these, I've, I've talked about um, Lichtenstein in uh, relation to Sikowski, Mike Sikowski to students. And I remember giving a, a lecture that touches on some of the things you've touched on, but from a completely different vantage point. And after the discussion was over, one of the students who was, who was very shy, who didn't talk that much, just said, I, you know, I just wanna say uh, how bad I feel for Mr. Sikowski and how, what, you know, they were, very, they were very halting in their speech and just how he would feel when he saw this. And I think that's, um, you know, when he saw how his, his work had been used in ways that he had no control over. Um, and I think that might be, um, that might be a, a pretty universal um, first response that people have uh, to these things, um, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that it's it's the correct response or the the beginning and end of the discussion. I want to read uh, from Mike McGee um, uh, in regards to your comments, Austin. There's a bit of, of a parallel between Giffen's work and the way that Brian Michael Bendis came up with Goldfish where there was a focus on getting the story out over artistic legitimacy. Bendis was smart enough to pull from photographs, which bridged the gap Mitchell was quoted about above. Oh, I, I, um, it's a comic I remember reading very well. Some of the way uh, this process works to me is not exactly the Picasso, good artist, copy, great artist steal, but an, uh, a frocable bit from him. Uh, to steal uh, properly, you must take complete ownership of the work. And if you fail at that, your art actually belongs to the one you tried to swipe from. Uh, there was a through line to Emerson there and then into transcendentalism, Gnosticism, uh, Confucianism, Zen. Thoughts from you, Jason? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I, that's, that's um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the meat of that for me is the, take complete ownership of the work. I, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I guess I like where, where Emerson goes with it, where the, like he makes that comment about there is no holder of the copyright, 
you know, they're that, I mean, he, he's sort of, maybe he's being utopian. I, I, I don't know, but it's, it's this, it seems to be this faith or belief that there is no ownership. There is no copy. I mean, it, I mean, maybe it's socialist. I don't know. I don't, I mean, these terms um, can be very limiting. And I think that there's like a, you know, Emerson is a spiritual man, a transcendentalist. I think he's really speaking to a larger, more cosmic, uh, uh, you know, he's, tr he's tr I see like, a, I don't know, the aperture opening up to the point where you, there's no longer an aperture. There's no barrier. There's no, there's no, there's no line, you know, and that's, I think it's really interesting that that Emerson believes that's where she, you know that's that's Shakespeare that's that's what that is, <clears throat> you know, um, and maybe that's what Giffen is. I don't I don't know or what the Dead Boys thing is. I I'm I'm not sure. Um, I yeah maybe because I have swiped so much I'm not really uninterested in ownership, but. Um, I, I see. I. I guess I see, I see it from my experience. For whatever that's worth, is is it's more of a. I feel like it's you know like when a, when you when someone calls up and is in truck they need some help, you know, it's like yeah I'll help you carry that let's 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 do it, you know and that's sort of that's sort of how at least the dead boys thing felt for me I felt like yeah no pro like I felt Kirby and. Gould and yeah, we'll help you carry this. We got we we got your back, and I, I think that um, I mean go, that goes way beyond form or or um, well, no, it doesn't. I mean, form and content are constantly reinforcing each other, and so perhaps to Mike's comment, which I think is really sharp, um, perhaps. It depends on, you know, what kind of gas you're putting in the tank, you know, if you're, if, but, but, but even that, see, I'm, even if you're the impurity of motive is I'm going to steal in order to get to meet the deadline, right? I still think there's, there's room and opportunity to um, have that, you know, turn into something greater and, and become part of something larger. Um, that for a lot of us, our transgressions, if we can hold them and, and look at them in the face and embrace them, they become our greatest assets. Um, there's, um, let's see. There are there, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of different uh, Giffen uh, quotes in here, um, but I encourage people to um, I'll I'll post when we when we have this as a um, as a if if um, we end up having this on YouTube um, by through your wishes, Jason, um, I'll, I'll have some links to to um, to some of these Giffen quotes that that people are discussing in the chat. Um, I want to I want to maybe if I can leave you with a question. Um, you know, I I, um, I think you you know you're talking a lot. You at the beginning you asked us to write down what a cartoonist is and and what our ideas of of swiping are. And you know you reference you know when we look at that the the um, Toth image and we look at the Sikowski image and the the um, the swipe that's being done. Uh, not, when we look at the Toth and the the Lichtenstein image and we look at, at Lichtenstein taking from Toth, um, there. You could maybe make the argument that they're interested in the same kind of um, uh, feeling that the viewer will come away with from from looking at this beautiful, um, you know, this 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 um, this beautiful drawing that Sikowski did um, uh, or that Toth did, um, and just maybe on a different scale, maybe with Lichtenstein, there's a there's a commentary on what media is and and all these things. We can, if we put all that aside, they're still making the same image and, and, and most viewers might respond to those images pretty similarly. And I'm wondering what you might think draws someone to not just what a cartoonist is, but what draws someone to become a cartoonist? What kind of people are drawn to be a cartoonist versus 
what draws people to other media. I think that might, it, it, that doesn't get us close to talking about what happens with Giffen and Munoz necessarily, but it might get us close to something about, about some of these issues. I mean, it, it, it won't answer it for us, but we can, it's something interesting to think about in relation to these questions, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, I can only think about that or comment on that from my own experience, you know, using, using my I statements. And I, I, I would imagine that <clears throat> there's nothing terribly unique to, to my experience uh, as, as in regards to what attracted me to, you know, want to make comics or be a, be a cartoonist or however I identify. Um, I, you know, there was something about, you know, that, that idea of the cartoonist for me, which was being a lone wolf, right? The, the things I shared earlier was what I immediately think of when I think of cartoonists, I think of lone wolf, uh, singular voice, Robert Crumb, he seems to be uh, uh, iconic, Charles Scholes, George Harriman, you know, these are people that did everything. They don't need anyone. <laughs> and, you know, I recognize, you know, that, that, and I don't think it's just a matter of, I mean, getting vulnerable is important or, but not, this is beyond Dear Diary stuff, but it's that I was, yeah, definitely attracted and still, I'm still like contending with those, with that idea of the cartoonist. I mean, simply because I recognize it doesn't nullify it. Unfortunately, I feel like, you know, I wish I could think my way into a different way of living, but I, I can't, I have to act my way into a different way of thinking. And um, so I'm still contending with, with, and still trying to understand or embrace, you know, the, the, the various attractors to comics that are, um, you know, I'm still identifying the ingredients, like wanting to be by yourself. You don't need anyone, you know, <laughs> I don't need any, I don't need anyone's help. Right. I mean, there's, there's formative experiences that I've had that are, you know, and I imagine other people have had that are directly linked to that. And, uh, you know, shame, huge, huge factor. I, I, I mean, I, I, I see it everywhere. I hear it everywhere, especially in circles of cartoonists. You know, shame at not making enough money, shame at making no money, shame at having only share, you know, having only sold uh, uh, 12 copies of their comic or having only sold 3,000, you know. I mean, money is a huge thing in there. I, from a young age, I was definitely conditioned to think about this as an occupation, you know, think about it as a way to make a living rather than to think of it as a way that is a living. And I still, I mean, I'm 20 years deep on this thing and I'm still setting off, you know, I'm still having like my motivations being being compelled, like being, being propelled to, you know, be popular or to do something that's going to like to, to rather, rather than having faith in myself and my experience, but to do something that's pre-established, that's, that's um, a pre-approved thing that can reach other people, you know, and it's not enough just to be alive, right? It's got to be a crime comic or it's got to be superheroes or one of the interesting byproducts of this dead boys story which i i shared with a bunch of people is there is a common language or like a, a recognizable vernacular that's that seems to be more inviting or more like uh, disarming I'm, I'm not entirely sure to a potential viewer i think that was, I think that's why pop art so is in part so successful is that you, you go into this big place, big rooms, big pictures of soup and, and comic book panels. And it's like, I, Hey, I know that, you know, I think, I think that's like, 
and and to some that's really like fucked up and distasteful and and tantamount to thievery but to others it's comforting i i don't know i mean it's um i i You know, I, to, to, for, if I were to try to boil this down and like try to get the swiping thing, you know, the, the, the article, the, the, the symbol of swiping or stealing or any of that stuff, comics, it's on a very just, you know, unattractive level. It's that I, like a lot of people, Am, am constantly trying to navigate life, uh, you know, while feeling afraid of, of being in fear. <laughs> and the thing that gives me hope uh, and, and the thing that gives me faith is actually making stuff. And, and part of that is, you know, while I'm making it, hey, things are going pretty good. No one's trying to mess with me. I'm having a good time, you know? Um, usually when I start recognizing that, well, then I start, you know, becoming in fear again. So it's, it's for me, the swiping, I see that as not, and I'm not Jose Munoz, I'm not, I'm not, um, how Foster or whoever, you know, has been swiped from, but I see it as a potential to nullify my ego so I can be in faith and not just be stuck in fear and, and where that leads to. And I'm well aware of where it leads to. I've got a lot of experience with that. It's not pretty, so. Well, I think it's it's funny because I mean I think that that conception that you're you're saying of of coming to comics because it's you can do it all on your own and you don't need anyone else. Um, such a good counter to that is I mean because swiping is is done it's in a way it's done with someone else. It's an admission that there isn't it isn't just your own imagination filling these filling these boxes. There is. There is someone else. So if if you're engaging in that, good or bad, however we come across it, it is you you are you are not just doing this yourself, you know. And I, I do think that like in what you're talking about, there there seems like such a relationship between that conflict of this idea of comics as this closed off, rugged individual system versus something that undercuts that. Um, well, I mean, and yeah, they get maybe a little too personal. I mean, <clears throat> I, I had a father that disappeared, you know, and I, it, it wasn't until I was an adult where I recognized I had an imaginary friend named Ralph when I would draw pictures of Ralph and I'd make comics of Ralph and books. He's always climbing mountains. He was always away, you know, he was, he was always somewhere else, but I could see him from afar. And, you know, it wasn't until well into adulthood, I came across some of these drawings and it was like, oh, it's my dad, you know? Like he looks, I drew him just the way I would, you know, in previous, you know, the drawings you do for school, like this is my family, you know, <laughs> like it was my dad. And so, you know, I can, I can totally recognize that, that for me making stuff, just period, but especially stories, you know, fiction and, 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 you know, wanting to be part of something larger, right? Like, like a continuum of like Chester Gould and Jack Kirby and whoever, you know, like it's, it's no different than in my personal life. I mean, I had a brother that passed away when I was very young and, you know, I've always wanted to like, have a brother or a dad, you know, it's just like, it's, this is part of my woundedness that I, you know, that, that is compelling me consciously or unconsciously to do certain things or to behave in certain ways. But yeah, I mean, I'm really, maybe like, you know, as Mike pointed out with the Bendis thing, like he's just trying to get to the deadline, 
right? So he's doing anything he can, doesn't matter. I'm gonna use anything I can to get to the deadline. I mean, I'm super down for those, those kinds of restraints. And for me, the, or constraints. And for me, it's like, whatever can get me into community, being part of something larger, I think per, for me is valid. And, 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 and somewhat essential, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like that riot. I mean, shit's going to go down. <laughs> you know, it's like, this isn't, this, this isn't just, you know, Shakespeare isn't just entertainment clearly. Right. You know, but it also is. Well, I think that's that's a perfect. Shakespeare isn't just entertainment, but it also is. That's good. <laughs> There's one one message here. Um, oh, it's for, it's from Bob Sikoriak, just thanking you, um, Jason, for this. And I thank you so much for this. This is a um, I I thought a beautiful beautiful talk, and um, one that I'm going to refer back to. Um, and, and one that I actually, you know, there's, there's so much more, I think we could continue discussing. Um, and I thank everyone, um, everyone for, um, participating in the chat and with their comments. Um, I think, uh, you know, you're all muted, uh, but we can all, we can all give, uh, Jason a, a round of applause for this. Um, and I, uh, let me just, uh, tend to some symposium business now. Um, please join us next week. Uh, we have Matthew Thurber speaking to the symposium. Um, a week after that, um, we have um, Inez Estrada scheduled, and that will actually be, um, I'll have more details if you're on our you know, mailing list and everything, uh, we'll actually be able to do that one uh, in person at, a, um, at a, a Brooklyn bookstore, in addition to it being available online. So we'll have more information about that. But for next week, at the same time, the same way you registered for this, that you registered for Jason's talk, you can register for uh, Matthew Thurber's talk. I'm just going to put a link really quickly here in the chat, and you can find it on the, the website with all the other symposium information. So thank you all so much, and a really special thank you to you, Jason, um, for, this, for this talk. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thanks for being here. All right. Well, uh, it's always funny ending a, a, a Zoom discussion because uh, we can't just all start uh, walking out the room together. But thank you all, and I'll, I'll see you guys next week. Bye. <laughs>